So, of course, I'm going to start by saying thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Cody Armstrong, and today we're discussing tips for complex assembly motion in Onshape. And this is really uh, stemming from a lot of questions that we get about certain types of motion at the assembly level. So we're going to go over some of the more complex mechanisms that you can create and how to get realistic motion out of them. And they're relatively simple, and it really uh, is dependent on the type of mates that you create and the relations that you use. So we're going to go over details in both of those areas and, and stick to the more complex end of assembly creation and the motion in particular. Um, so let's dig into it. As I always say with these webinars, we really encourage you to ask any questions that you'd like. There's a question section in the Go to Webinar Control Panel. Feel free to ask any question that you'd like, and I'll do my best to stop and answer the questions as we go through the webinar. So without further ado, I want to jump right into things and get started. So the goals today are pretty straightforward. Uh, I want to introduce kind of the basic concept of mates and relations. We're going to start really, really simple uh, and then show a few simple examples of the different relations, you know, gear relations, rack pinion relations, limb relations, and so on. Um, the, the idea behind this is to answer frequently asked questions. So we get questions often about how do I get realistic gear motion in my assembly or how do I get realistic rack pinion motion in my assembly? I'm going to walk you through how we do that. Uh, I, I have both very, very simple examples and you know examples that are more complex that involve more detail. Um, as always, again, feel free to ask any questions and I'll do my best to stop and answer them as we go through things. This is meant for those that are relatively new to assemblies and relatively new to building realistic motion at the assembly level. Um, and it's meant as an introduction into to mates and relations and, and how they work together. So let's dig into it. Um, what I'd like to do is start with a simple explanation of a mate. And this is the most basic explanation that I can give you for how we put parts together at the assembly level. Um, it's a way of constraining parts or assemblies, sub-assemblies, right, relative to one another. So this is how we attach parts to one another via mates. The mates use what we refer to as mate connectors uh, to define the relationship between parts. So this is different than if you have experience, for instance, with SolidWorks or you know other CAD applications that use combinations of faces. And on shape, we select a point on one part, a mate connection point, a mate connection point in another part, and we bring those together. Now, I often get asked the question, and I believe I've, I've gotten in, in an email form just for this webinar, um, how do we define what that relationship is and, and how those two interact? And it's important to point out, when you select a point on one part and you select a point on another part, it creates a coordinate system at each of those points with an X, Y, and Z axis. And we're aligning those coordinate systems when you create the mate. That's an important distinction because there may be a time when you need to rotate how the part looks. There may be a time when you need to flip the orientation of the part or align an edge of the part with the X or the Y axis of the coordinate system of the mate connector, right? So it's important to understand kind of the fundamentals of how that works. I'm going to start with a simple example of how you can align gears in an assembly. That's one of the more common questions I get, especially with regards to editing mates, right? Now, one last caveat, one last thing that I want to point out <clears throat> with regards to our mates is the mate type that you choose, the fastened mate, the revolute mate, the cylindrical mate, whatever mate that you choose defines the motion between those parts, the degrees of freedom between those parts, right? So if I mate a bolt to a hole, I wouldn't expect a bolt to move, right, to spin, to move up or down or anything. And in that situation, you would use a fastened mate that restricts all degrees of freedom at once. Now, if it's something else, right, maybe it's a shaft that needs to spin inside of a pocket, for instance, a hole, um, I would use a different mate. I would use a revolute mate that allowed for that rotational degree of freedom. My point here is, again, the mate that you choose defines how those parts interact with what, each other, right? The degrees of freedom between them, the motion between them. So that's the, the simplest explanation I can give you for a mate in Onshape. We're just taking those two points and bringing them together. The type of movement that you get is defined by the type of mate that you choose. And how the parts align to one another is dependent on that mate connector, which is, again, just a small coordinate system with an X, Y, and Z axis that we're aligning. 
I'm going to go over examples of how you can edit those and align them the way you need to uh, in just a bit, so bear with me. The other thing I would stress is we aren't going to spend a ton of time going over mates in general in this webinar. We're going to spend more time going over relations that are needed for the more complex motion. Um, the thing that I would stress is if you're brand new to on-chip assemblies, you've never created mates, or you don't quite understand mates, I definitely recommend checking out some of our past webinars on, on on-chip mates, on on-chip assemblies. Uh, they go over in more detail kind of the basics of assemblies and, and mating parts together. We are going to stick to some of the more complex examples where you've already mated parts in a place and we're trying to tie them together with relations. But that's a, a basic intro into mates. Um, one question, if one modifies the part, will the original mate connector remain until specifically changed? Yes. It, it, it will update with the geometry that uh, surrounds it. So if you, you know, reference a hole, for instance, and move that, it will update. But um, I, I hope that answers the question. It's relative to the face and more often than not that you're referencing over. Um, so it's, it is intelligent in the sense that if I locate... Uh, a main connector at the center of a hole, for instance, and I move the hole, the main connector should move with it. All right, so now let's get into kind of the basics of a relation. This is different than a mate, and that's an important distinction to understand. Um, mates are how we bring parts together. Relations are how we define the movement between parts, between essentially multiple mates or single mate, just depends on the scenario. So essentially, you can think of this as a relationship between mates, right? And so if for every rotation of this part, which is probably going to be a revolute mate, I'd expect X amount of linear travel out of this part, which is defined by a slider mate. Right? That's one example. So all we're really doing with a relation is we're tying two mates together and defining for every movement of this, we want X movement of that. Right? That's really what a relation does. You're bringing a relationship between two mates together. Um, so it's important to, to stress. One of the most important things I would stress about relations is they use existing mates to define the movement between parts, and that is uh, different than you know, other CAD systems that exist out there. If I wanted to create a gear relation, I would start right off with a gear relation in some other systems. But in Onshape, you would mate the gears into place so that they rotated you know, accordingly. And then I would create a relationship between that mate that constrained it so that it, one moved at a certain ratio relative to the other. So it's important to stress in all of these examples I'm going to show you, you must have the part mated into place first. Right, and you have to have the correct motion between them. Right, so in the case of a gear, for instance, if I want a gear to move at a certain ratio relative to another gear, obviously the gears need to be free to spin. Right, so you need that revolute mate or that cylindrical mate that has that rotational degree of freedom in order for that to work. Right, I just want to, to stress that. Question, can we relate relations? Meaning, can, can we marry relations for a motion that includes many relations? No, not yet. That's a good question. So what I'm going to show you is largely a single relation, and I'll show you how to animate and things like that in the, past, in the future, but right now you can't compound relationships on top of one another, which I believe is what you're asking. So once it hits this, then do this, you know, in the relations. Um, so right now it's a single relationship between two things, and I can't um, tie them together to create more complex motion. I think that's, that's the answer to the question. All right, so the last thing I want to mention, four different types of relations, gear, screw, racket pinion, and linear. So let's get into them. And as I mentioned earlier, I really like to treat this as more of like an FAQ because I think this is what drives the webinar. And, and so we get asked questions about certain types of motion. I want to go through you know, those types of motions and how I would do that non-shape. Right? So we're going to start with simple gears. Uh, what about gears? How do you create realistic gear motion in on-shape? And the short answer is the gear relation. Right? The gear relation allows you to define a ratio between two gears. More specifically, a ratio between two rotational degrees of freedom. 
right? So I mate my gears into place with their Revolut mate, so they're free to rotate. And then I just define a relationship between those two mates, right? Um, so the important caveat here is that you must choose a mate with a rotational degree of freedom. So important first step, mate your gear to wherever it's mated to, but make sure that it's free to spin. Because if you mate it fastened, for instance, then you're not going to get that realistic motion. You can't create a gear relation with it. Now, let's get into an example of this. There is, well, as I mentioned earlier, I want to start with simple examples, but they give you an idea of kind of what's possible um, with more complex scenarios. So I want to start really basic uh, with just a simple two-gear scenario. Right, so in this example, you know, I have two gears of different sizes. If I rotate one, you can see they're not related to one another at all. Right, so there's no relationship. They are free to spin. Right, each gear can spin on its plate here that it's mounted to, but they're not tied to one another in any way. Right, and that's where the relationship comes in. Keep in mind, we've already mated these two. Important thing to stress, I'm going to say it over and over again throughout this webinar, it's, it's dependent on existing mates, right? So what we're really doing is defining a ratio between these two mates. This says for every one rotation of this, move this X, right, or rotate this X. So that's really the key to understanding relationships, or relations, excuse me, and the relationships that we're creating. Um, so how do we do this? Pretty straightforward. There are four different relations to choose from. Uh, the gear relation is the furthest on the left of all the relations, but the relations in general on the far right of the toolbar. Right, you'll see the four icons here. We'll start with a gear relation. Just click gear relation from the toolbar. Then choose the mates that are associated with it. Right, as I mentioned before, this is where you select your mates that you've already created to attach the parts you know, to the assembly. So in this example, it's Revolut 1 and Revolut 2, right? Those are the two mates that I want to create a relation between. Then I define a ratio. So for every one rotation of this, how much should this rotate, right? We'll say 1.25, right? And that's really it. You select your two rotational degrees of freedom, in this case, the two Revolut mates that the gears are mated with, and then I define a ratio between those two. All right, I hit the green check OK, and now I test the motion out. Now, one uh, caveat is you'll always want to test the motion. And the reason I say that is it just so happens in this example um, that the, the ratio is correct and the direction is correct. So if I rotate, you can see you know, that I get that correct rotation ratio. Right, all the teeth are aligning. It would be rather obvious if I didn't get that right. You'd see the teeth meshing in weird ways. So the reason I stress testing it, grabbing and dragging it, is that it may be reversed. You may get the opposite direction. And then this is the case for uh, just about any of the relations that I'm going to show you today. You always want to keep that in mind. Uh, many of these relations have a reverse direction checkbox. If by default you, you click the green check, you rotate it, and you, you notice, oh, this is backwards right, from what I need. Just check reverse direction, right, and that will give you that, um, that correct alignment. Okay? So, again, that's the simplest example I can give you of a gear relation. We're just defining a ratio between these two mates. For, uh, you know, for every rotation of this, move this or rotate this X amount. Right, ratio. So that's the important thing to understand about the gear relation. One last thing that I would mention about this example, and, and this kind of ties into what I discussed earlier, and that is editing of mate connectors. So in the actual mate that you define, right, in your mate uh, features, you'll find mate connectors. If you expand the mate, you'll find mate connectors. These are the individual mate connectors, the coordinate systems that are created automatically as you create your mates. Right? So these are automatically generated. The reason I bring this up is I'm often asked the question, you know, how would I rotate a part nine degrees? Or how would I align this edge of my part with this edge of the model? Or, you know, what if I wanted to flip this orientation of the mate? Or by default, it's upside down and it should be the other way. Well, chances are, if you can't edit in the mate, command itself, you can always right click and edit the mate connector. 
And you have these options that are worth mentioning. For instance, you can realign the make connector, the way the part's oriented with an edge of the model. That's very common. So if I want you know, two edges to be parallel with one another, uh, it's easy for me to make the two parts into place and then edit the mate connector, realign, and select an edge. And that will allow me to align my part with another very quickly. You can also move, and this is the, the question I get asked often, you know, how would I rotate a part you know, 10 degrees or something like that? That's really not an option when you're creating the mate. You can uh, reorient the secondary axis to four or to ninety degrees, right? Four different positions. But if you wanted something anywhere between zero and ninety, you would need to go in and move the mate, right? And so you'll see a checkbox for move. You could say rotate about Z, and you can see I've punched in twenty-one degrees. In fact, that's how I've gotten the teeth to to align. One of the biggest problems that you'll have with gears specifically is that when you mate them into place, they're unlikely to have the teeth meshing perfectly right off the bat, unless they were modeled together. Right. So what you'll need to do is rotate one gear or the other to align the teeth. And there's no magic process. There may be other techniques for aligning them, but in my case, I just rotated this this number around until the teeth looked like they were lined up. Right. And then from that point forward, you know, then it's just the gear relation that controls the ratio between them. Right? But it's an excellent example of where I might edit a mate connector. And that's a question that's come up. I've even gotten emails on it. You know, how would you go about changing or making small tweaks to the mate connectors? Keep in mind, you can expand out each of the mates that you create and then choose a mate connector and edit it. Another uh, point that I would make is you can even create explicit mate connectors uh, associated with parts. So if you find yourself, you know, uh, always inserting this part and then rotating it by 12 degrees, let's say, that's just this repetitive thing that you have to do because of the geometry that you're working with. You can create an explicit mate connector that's aligned with an edge or rotated nine degrees and then always have that mate connector anywhere you insert that part. So it saves you the time of having to individually edit each mate. It's something to consider, uh, something we've covered in, in you know, other webinars in the past. Um, you can look for custom mate connectors as examples or just general assembly webinars. But it's important to understand um, you can create your own mate connectors. And, and generally that's reserved for the more rare cases, the more um, odd geometry. But there are advantages to doing it for something like a gear, for instance, where I know that I'm going after rotated X amount. I could just create a bait connector once, and anywhere I answer that gear, I just reference that make connector, and it'll come in the correct position. It really just depends on your scenario and how you've you've built your model. All right, so enough on that. This is a simple example of a gear, and I just wanted to go into briefly editing the make connectors, just to give you an option for aligning your parts either relative to, to edges or just you know relative to X, Y, and Z and, and the rotation value. So... What is a more complicated example look like? Um, so it's important to keep in mind that was one relation between two gears. But you can have as many gear relations as you would like. And so this is an example of a four-stage planetary gearbox, right, with uh, dozens of gears you know, throughout. Um, so actually, I think it's you know, one, two, three. Yeah, at least... 20, including the sun. Um, so it's a more complex example, but it's essentially built the same exact way. Uh, it's just these are subassemblies with their own gear relations. You'll see each stage is a subassembly with its own gear relations. Um, but when you bring it to the top level, you mate the, the parts correctly, you have that gear relation at the top level, you can create this more complex gear reduction scenario, right? So this is nothing more than what I just shown you, but done, you know, a couple dozen times and, and with a more complex example. One other thing I would mention, this is just a tip, this is a neat thing that you can do, is you can right click and animate any mate with a degree of freedom, right? So basically any mate that has movement, any part that has movement, you can right click the mate and you could say animate. So in this case, we're just going to animate one of the uh, Revolut mates that control this. And if I just hit play, it will take a moment to calculate. There are a lot of gear relations going on here, but then it will go through and animate that, you know, planetary gear set, right? And so you can see 
one end of it spinning very fast. If I zoom in on the other end here, you can see the output shaft you know, spinning very slowly, right? So gives you an idea of kind of what's possible. This is just a more complex scenario, but again, it was built using the same exact gear relations that I showed you with that simple example, right? Um, all right, so that is the the gear relation and kind of the quintessential example of gears where you just kind of have these spur gears that are related to one another and very simple examples but it's important to keep in mind this is more than just you know simple spur gear type relationships uh, the question i get asked often is well what about worm gears or, or helical gears or those types of things um, it's the same exact process Right, so it doesn't matter whether it's worm gears or spur gears, or, you know, um, any of those scenarios. Even the the planetary gearbox is just a normal, you know, gear relation done many times. Right, worm gears work the exact same way. All you're doing is defining the rotational a, a relationship between those rotational values for the worm gear. Right. So let's go over a simple example of this. Bear with me for a second here. Here we have a simple worm gear assembly. And I'm going to hide a few parts here just to drill down into this. And you can see at the bottom here, we have two revolute mates. Uh, the two revolute mates define the rotational degree of freedom. Remember, we still need that rotation. Right? So we have the rotation for the worm and for the worm gear. What we need to do now is define a ratio between those. Right? So... I'll select my gear relation, I'll select my two gears, and define a ratio. And what I'm saying, just as I did before, is for every one rotation of this, I would expect 30 rotations here, right? And forgive me, I got that backwards in terms of my selections. We want this to rotate, you know, for every 30 rotations of this, right? And the order is important there. So in understanding the relationship one to another uh, is the ratio that you're giving. Right? So hit the green check. Let's see. There we go. Right? So let's right click and animate play. And we should get realistic worm gear motion. Looks like I need to align. Actually, nope. This is an excellent example where it's going the wrong direction. Right? This is an excellent example where I need to reverse the direction. So I'll edit the gear relation, check reverse direction, and now if I animate, let's hit play, I should get realistic. There we go. Yeah. So now I'm getting the correct motion. Sometimes you have to go in and rotate and grab and drag or, or animate and see is it working the right way. You can do that, by the way, in the actual gear relation. You can grab and drag while you're in the gear relation. You don't have to accept it. Um, but again, you'll want to test that motion out to make sure it's going the right way. Sometimes you'll need to check that reverse direction checkbox. All right, so again, it's just to illustrate, this is a worm gear example, but it's using the same gear relation that we used in the past. It's just, you know, we're just defining two rotational degree, degrees of freedom that happen to be, you know, going in different directions. So, all right. Um, that is a simple example of worm gears. The next example I'd like to get into is a rack pinion example. Uh, I have an arbor press that I like to use as this example, but essentially, um, you're defining a ratio between a rotational degree of freedom and a linear degree of freedom. And so if you think of an arbor press as an example, as I rotate the handle, I'd expect that to go up and down. Right? That's a linear motion created by a rotational value. And that's where rack and pinion is the most valuable. That's where you're going to use it. Right? So important thing to stress, one rotational degree of freedom one linear degree of freedom, and you're just tying the two together. The the arbor press example, I'd rotate that handle, and for every rotation of the handle, I'd expect X amount of linear travel, you know, out of the actual press. So um, that's a, a good example of rack pinion. Of course, there are many examples of of a rack pinion type of mechanical setup and why you might need it, but I'd like to keep things basic. Again, the the two things to stress is you'll need a rotational degree of freedom and a linear degree of freedom, right? So if we look at our ArborPress example, we have both of those things. We have a slider mate 
if we animate the slider mate, you can see it just allows uh, up and down movement, right? It's a, just a simple slider mate that allows it to move up and down, right? That's our linear degree of freedom. And we also have a revolute mate that defines the handle of the arbor press that allows the handle to spin, right? So if we right click and animate here, if I hit play, you can see that handle's free to spin. But right now, there's no relationship between those two, and that's why we need to create the relation, right? So in this example, it wouldn't be a gear relation. It would be a rack pinion relation, right? So I'd select rack pinion relation, then select the two mates that are involved. In this case, the rotational degree of freedom and the linear degree of freedom. And then I just define, okay, for every rotation, how much linear travel should I get, right? In this case, we'll say 2.25, right? I'll hit the green check, okay. And as always, I like to test things out by grabbing and dragging. And you can see that is not right. That is backwards, right? So here, we'll edit the rack pinion, check reverse direction, and we should be good to go. Right. Again, keep in mind, you'll want to test that motion out just to make sure it's correct. Uh, you know, I'd recommend just doing it right there while you're in it. Um, but again, you'll want to at some point verify that it's moving the correct way. If not, you'll need to reverse direction. All right. So that is the rack pinion relation. The key thing to stress, a linear degree of freedom and a rotational degree of freedom. We're just tying the two together and defining a relationship between them. Another question that I get asked often is, does it matter which part that you move? You know, if I grab this part, does this part move? And the answer is yes, right? It, it doesn't matter which part you grab, they are tied together. You know, it doesn't matter which one you choose to, to grab and move, right? All right, so that is the rack pinion relation. Let's move on. To, do, to the next example that I have for you, and that is linear actuation, right? This is a commonly asked question. You know, for every rotation of X, how do I get linear movement uh, that's, that's normal to that rotational direction, right? I showed you with rack pinion where we could create a rotational degree of freedom and that linear degree of freedom moves up and down. Um, but in the screw relation, I would expect the movement to be in line with the rotational degree of freedom that I have. Um, the threaded rod is the most common example, like an Acme screw thread, for instance, where I would expect this the a actual you know movement as I rotate you know in and out. Think of a, a milling machine or a lathe, for instance, where you use linear actuation. That's just one example. A vise is another good example, as you can see from the screenshot, where as I grab the handle of the vise and twist it, I expect it to move in and out. Right. So that's an excellent example of the screw relation. Right, so it's important to stress if this is what you're looking for, screw relation is the tool that you that you need. Um, the important thing to stress is it it requires both a rotational degree of freedom and a linear degree of freedom. And what you're doing is you're defining a ratio, just like we did in the rack pinion example. For every one rotation of this, move this x amount, you know, based on whatever you input. Now. What's different here is that you can choose linear degree of freedom that is, you know, normal to the direction of the rotation, right? Um, or you can even choose one mate that has both degrees of freedom, right? So the example I would give you, let me open up the machine vise here, is this machine vise. And you can see that, you know, I'm not getting realistic motion. If I twist the handle, I'm not getting that realistic, you know, moving in and out based on my rotations. And that's because we just have simple mates defining this. Very basic cylindrical mates, fastened mates, slider mate, and so on, right? There's no relationship, no relations as of yet. What I'd like to do is define a relation that says for every, you know, one rotation of this handle, I'd expect, let's say, 0.5 inches of travel, right? So what I would do in this case uh, is create a screw relation, right? Now, what's unique about this example is, you know, all, in all the other examples, we chose a, you know, a mate from one part and a mate from another part. But in this example, we really only need one mate. It's the one cylindrical mate that attaches the, the spindle, the threaded rod, to the base, right? So there's one mate that has both a rotational degree of freedom and a linear degree of freedom. 
and that's the cylindrical mate. So I showed you earlier how you can select two mates and define a relationship between two mates, but that may not always be the case. Right? In this example, it's just one mate that attaches the threaded rod to the base, but that one mate has both rotation and it allows it to move in and out. And so from there, it's just a matter of saying, well, for every rotation, I want distance 0.5. Uh, I can hit the green check OK, and now grab and drag, and you can see it is backwards. Right? Let's go back, edit, reverse direction, try this again, grab and drag, there we go. So now when I rotate the handle, I get that 0.5 inch movement for every rotation. Right? So that's a very simple example, admittedly, but one thing that I'd like to stress with this example is it's not always... You know, choosing one mate from one part, one mate from another part. Most of the time that's the case, but not always. And there will be scenarios like this where it's just I, I mated one part to the base part. There's one mate that defines both degrees of freedom that I need. So I just need the one mate. Right? Now, another thing I'd like to stress, this is, you know, makes it even more confusing in some scenarios is you know, keep in mind, you can also choose a degree of freedom from a, a mate that has multiple. So, for instance, in the gear example that I gave you earlier, I chose a Revolute mate, and that one Revolute mate had the rotational degree of freedom. But I could have easily chose, chosen a, a cylindrical mate. And then what would happen is because a cylindrical mate has two degrees of freedom, right, rotational and linear, a dialogue would pop up and say, which degree of freedom would you like to choose? And you could choose the rotational degree of freedom from a mate that has multiple degrees of freedom. I hope that makes sense. Um, in every example I've shown you, it's been pretty linear. You know, one mate to one mate, you know, one degree of freedom to one degree of freedom. Um, and in, in many situations, your, your work will be like that. But in some cases, keep in mind, it's flexible. You can choose one mate that has multiple degrees of freedom. You could choose one degree of freedom from a mate that has multiple. Yeah, um, it, it's fairly flexible. So, just keep that in mind. It's really about just tying those degrees of freedom together so that they behave uh, relative to one another. All right. So let's move on to the next one in my list. That is the screw relation. Okay. And the question there is, again, what about linear actuation? What about threaded rod scenarios or Acme screw threads where I'd expect linear movement for a rotation? That's really what the screw relation is all about. So let's move on to the next example. And this is something that I get asked quite often. As I mentioned before, this webinar isn't really all about relations. There are a few types of motions that aren't necessarily relation bound, but just more complex mates. And I wanted to cover them here. And one of them is the tangent mate. This is something we don't cover in great detail in a lot of other webinars. And I wanted to get into it um, because it has a number of useful examples that I can give you. And, and they kind of tie into the more advanced complex motion theme. So there are a few examples where I might use tangent mate. One of the more obvious is a camshaft with followers, right? So if you think of kind of the quintessential engine where you have your camshaft and you have your your valves that go up and down and, and they're you know actuated via the rotation of the camshaft, that's an example where you would use a tangent mate. And all you're doing is establishing a tangent relationship between the faces in uh, the camshaft and the face of the follower, right? Or the lifter or whatever it may be. So that's an example of a tangent mate. That's just one example where you'd use a tangent mate. Um, you can select faces, you can select edges, you can select uh, uh, vertices to define tangent. The one thing that I would stress that's different about the tangent mate versus all other mates really that we have at Onshape is that you do not select mate connectors. This is what makes it different. So in the tangent mate, you select faces, you select edges, you select vertices. You don't get mate connection points when you select tangent mate, right? And that makes it different than basically every other mate non shape. But it's it's you know necessary because what we're doing with a tangent mate was we're making faces tangent. So of course you know selecting those faces or the edges associated with those faces is important, right? So this is a bit different than you know a lot of other um, commands. Um, other mates, I should say, at the assembly level, but it has a reason for that. And that's because, you know, that's really what we're doing. We're tying those faces together. Now, it's not just the kind of camshaft example that I think this really applies to. Another question that I get asked often is, what about a part following a path, 
where you know I need this part to follow a groove, for instance, and the groove isn't linear or circular, right? Where I can't just use a linear or circular feature, or I can't just use something else. Um, this is an example where tangent mate is really useful. So if you ever have a situation where you know I want these parts to follow a certain path, the path isn't linear or circular. Um, tangent mate is is what I would use. Right. So I'm going to go over both examples. Bear with me for just a moment. I want to start really simple um, with the path example. Um, I'm going to start really, really simple, and then I'll get into a more complex example where you might use this. So I mentioned before, what if I wanted a part to stay within some kind of a path? Right. That's an example where I might use tangent mate. Now, tangent mate is right about in the middle of the assembly toolbar. You'll see it right about here. You'll select it. Then just select a face, edge, or vertex associated with whatever you want to make tangent. So in this case, I'll select this face of the pin, click in the next box, click on one of the faces within the path that I want to follow. In this case, we'll just select this face. What will happen is OnShape will automatically select all the tangent connected faces associated with the thing that you've clicked on. So I clicked on this face, it automatically grabs all the tangent connected faces attached to that face. You can see in this example, the pin is mated, but it's it's reversed. It's tangent to the outside of those faces, not the inside. So what I want is to flip the primary axis, right? That will flip it around. And now my pin is within the groove that I want it to follow. So I can hit the green check OK. And now if I grab and drag, the pin will maintain that relationship with the path. So it goes and it stops as soon as I hit a certain point, as soon as I hit the end of the path. If I move over here, it goes till it stops, right? So keep in mind, this is how I would get that basic, you know, part following a path-like behavior at the assembly level, right? So that's the first and, and probably most basic example I can give you of a tangent mate. Part following a path, you're just selecting, you know, in this case, just faces on each part, and it automatically finds all the tangent connected faces and, and creates that, that tangent mate, right? Question, if you want to limit your tangent mate, you could choose some surfaces only. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I think so. I don't see why not. Um, I'd have to try it to be 100% certain, but I, I think that that would work. Um, question. In that case, you should use split. If you want to limit your tangent mate, you could use some surfaces only. By surfaces, I assume like, like construction surfaces that you've imported into the assembly. Um, you could split the part first, um, but it's still going to grab, it should still grab anything tangent connected. Um, so there are other ways to, to restrict it. You may consider, you know, construction surfaces as a tool. All right. So that's a simple example of tangent mate. Now this is tangent mate where, you know, I, I, the part follows a given path, but you know, another example that I could give you for this is bear with me for a moment. Um, another part where, you know, a, a pin follows a path and that pin following a path gives you really unique motion. Um, the example I like to give for this is a fishing reel. So bear with me for a second here. We have this fishing reel. And of course, when you spin a fishing reel, um, what you would expect is the ability to, you know, the, the actual spool to move up and down, right? Um, so let's hide some of these external pieces here just to show some of the inside pieces of this. The way this is set up, is in this case, you can see an oscillating slider shaft. And if I hide it, you can see there's a pin extruding out of this gear. That pin, this boss extruding out of this gear, right, is located within the oscillating slider, right? So there is a tangent relation between that extruded boss and this path. Right? This is just a simple groove. But that relationship right, gives us the linear actuation when you spin the handle. 
right? So that that boss locating within the groove of the oscillating slider is what gives us that linear actuation as this moves up and down. And that's just another example where I would use tangent mate to define a tangent relationship between the face of the the boss in this oscillating gear and the slider itself, right? All right, so that is a simple example of the the tangent mate uh, used in that kind of path scenario, right? Bear with me for a moment. Give me just a second here. I just want... So a, a comment that was pointed out, um, and this is a good comment that was pointed out in the forums, um, there is a topic on uh, tangent mates on a surface. And it, it has been mentioned on the forums. In fact, there's a posted example, a good example of using that. Uh, I definitely recommend checking it out. The name of the forum post is Roller Roll on the Curved Surface. Uh, if you do a search for something along those lines, you'll find it's a great post that was mentioned by someone there in the comments uh, that's worth checking out if that's what you're you're doing. Question. By tangent connected faces, do you mean tangent in the sketch from which the slot was derived? No. This is tangent between the faces that are generated. So the sketch has nothing to do with it. Um, this would work just as well on an imported model as it would anything else. It's really using the faces. So you're saying, I want these faces to always be tangent to one another. Right. All right. So let's move on. What I'd like to get into next. So that's kind of the, the path example of tangent mate. And that's one of the questions that I get asked very often is how do we make a part follow a path? And and this is the tool that I would use. The tangent mate is the tool that I would use. Um, so what I'd like to do next is show you another example of tangent mate, and that is that camshaft example that I was mentioning earlier. Um, so as, as I've done with most of the examples, I'd like to start really basic with a single cam and follower, real simple example. Um, but they get into a more complex example. So if we edit the tangent mate, one thing I would point out is I can select faces, but I can also select a combination of edges, right? So in this example, we've selected all of these edges of part five, right, in our cam, and then we just selected one face of the follower right, in this example. So keep in mind, I showed you two faces, and that's probably the most common selections. Uh, but you can select other things. You can select edges as well. Uh, but again, all we're doing is we're saying we want this face to remain tangent to these series of edges. All right. So when I go to animate, animate my degree of freedom, forgive me, hit play, you'll see that relationship is maintained as it rotates. The tangency between the face and the series of edges that I've selected is maintained right, throughout the entire rotation. Very simple example, but another example of tangent mate. And this is quite a bit different than the, the path example that I was showing you just a moment ago. Here we're getting that, that linear actuation based on a cam follower type scenario. Um, so that is a simple example of a tangent mate for cam type situations where all you're really doing is defining a, you know, a tangent relationship between you know, a series of faces and or a series of edges or even a vertice. Now, as I mentioned before, very similar to the the uh, gear example that I showed you earlier, this really compounds. So, um, you know, you can have, and if you imagine a, a traditional, you know, um, engine, internal combustion engine, it has, you know, cam shafts and it has followers. It's not going to be just one cam follower. It's going to be potentially dozens. Um, so it's really just taking that example one step further. You can have as many tangent mates as you'd like. Right. So in this example, you can see we have several tangent mates. Um, and if I rotate the camshaft, let's just do a quick animation of this. We should get that realistic, you know, um, valve moving up and down behavior like you'd expect in a cylinder head of an engine. Right. Um, but this just takes it to the next level. It's really just the same example I showed you a moment ago, but done, you know, uh, uh, eight or nine times. Right. So it's the same thing as before, but just done eight or nine times. <laughs> 
But that's how I would get that that realistic linear actuation based on cam type movement, right? Um, where you have the cam and follower type scenario. All right, so that is the tangent mate. Again, the tangent mate isn't a relation necessarily. You're just defining a, ratio, uh, a relationship between faces. It's not between mates. It's different. Uh, it's different in a lot of ways. So you notice that I'm not selecting mate connectors, right? That's that's something you do for every other mate type, but but tangent mate is unique in the sense that you're selecting faces or edges. Um, and, it's, and it's useful in a number of different situations. Path examples that I've shown you and the cam examples that I've shown you. I'm sure there are others that you could think of, but it is useful in any type of situation where you need to maintain tangent relationships between parts, right? All right, so that is the tangent mate. The last example that I have for you here today is a swivel. And it's another example that I get asked questions often about is how do I create realistic swivel-like motion where it's free to rotate in all directions, but it can't move up, down, left, or right. There's no linear movement allowed, right? And if you think of a swivel and an eye, that's kind of the, the quintessential example I can give you of a ball mate. Right, where you have the swivel on the eye, they're they're you know pressed into one another. It's still free to spin, you know, the it's still free to spin within it, but it can't move relative to the eye, right? Its only degree of freedom is rotation, all rotation in any direction, but no linear degree of freedom. And in this situation, the in the swivel si situation, the example I'm giving you is the control arms where you have the spindle and you, you know, in that, you know, control arm spindle scenario, it's going to rotate in many directions, up, down, and you have the rotational degree of freedom of the spindle. And in that situation, you would need swivels and eyes and you would need that ball mate at those points of connection to allow that necessary motion, right? So again, just a frequently asked question, how do I get realistic swivel-like motion in Onshape? And the short answer is the ball mate. Use the ball mate and mate it just the way you would just about any other mate in Onshape. I have a simple example for you of a, a pneumatic cylinder. And in the pneumatic cylinder example, you know, we have the swivel and we have the eye. We want to make the swivel to the eye. But of course, this needs to be free to spin in all directions. So I can't just fasten this to this. It wouldn't be realistic. You know, this needs to be free to pivot in different directions because of, you know, whatever I'm attaching this to. So I would use the ball mate. Just select the ball mate from the toolbar. And just like any other mate, with the exception of tangent mate, you're just going to select a mate connector on one part. You can see right here. There's my mate connector at the center of the swivel, and then we'll choose the mate connector at the center of the eye, just like all the other mates that we're used to, and that should bring the two together. One final caveat, I, 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 you know, this, I mentioned this in the kind of the basics of assemblies, but keep in mind, again, we only solve for the active mate while you're in the mate command. It isn't until you accept the mate or click solve that we solve for all the mates in the assembly. Right, so just a final caveat. I know I mentioned that in the assemblies um, webinar, but I want to mention it again. So now what we get is realistic rotation, right? So the swivel is free to pivot in the eye in whatever direction that it wants, right? Um, and so you get that realistic kind of pivoting behavior. And when I go to attach this to something else, it will be free to pivot around that point. Um, again, think of the the control arms and spindle example where the control arm's got to move up and down, but also the spindle needs to be free to rotate at any movement along that up and down rotation, that amount of travel, right? And that is an excellent example of where I would use something like the ball mate. The ball mate is, is just a normal mate type. There's nothing really special about it, but it doesn't allow any linear degree of freedom. So the swivel won't be able to move left or right or up or down. It can only rotate. It rotate in all directions, but it's only allowed to rotate. Right. So I hope that's clear. Um, that is one of the common questions that I get asked. So I wanted to, to wrap things up here. Bear with me for a moment. I have a few questions, and I wanted to wrap things up with a um, simple example of a linear relation. And the reason I, I bring this up is I get asked the question often, is it possible to tie parts together so that when I move one, another moves with it, right? And they move at the same ratio or a given ratio. 
And this is an example where I might use something like uh, a linear relation, right? Um, so to give you an example of this, um, we have, you know, in this example, just a, a um, you know, automation frame, let's say. And I have these uh, linear rails and guides. Uh, and of course, what I would expect is these to move together. When I grab one, they would both move together. And so what we have is what we call a linear relation. And all you're really doing with a linear relation is you're establishing a relation between two linear degrees of freedom. They should move either together or in opposite directions, right? Some kind of ratio between them. So this is, you know, the same relation, but again, keep in mind, we're just defining two mates that both have linear degrees of freedom. In this case, we have a slider mate. Um, in this case, let's do slider one and two. So we're just defining a ratio between two slider mates, right? And so now when we move one, they both move together. So these were just two independent slider mates. You could move these independently of one another just a moment ago. We defined a linear relation tying the two together. Now, I didn't change anything, but you can change the ratio. So you can say, you know, if I move this one this amount, move this one one and a half times that or two times that. So if you want one to move twice as fast as the other, you can. You can also reverse the direction, and that will ensure they go in opposite directions. They're still related but they move in perfectly opposite directions, right? So, um, you know, again, it just depends on your scenario and what it is that you're doing. But that's the last relation that I wanted to mention here today. And I think one of the last examples that I get asked questions, you know, very commonly or, or quite a bit. So that is what I had planned for you. I see a few outstanding questions. So let's go through them. Uh, question, can we limit the range of angle in the swivel? No. So in almost every other mate, there is a limits checkbox, but ball mate and fasten mate, you know, fasten mate for obvious reasons doesn't doesn't have that. Um, so just keep in mind, you know, today there's no way to restrict the range of rotation of a of a ball mate. Uh, but that is something we we would like your feedback on. Um, if you want to restrict that, I know that's something you could do with a number of other different mates, but ball mate is unique in that sense. It doesn't have that option. Question, any future plans for springs? Tension, direction, two parts are spring-loaded and they need to move, for example. This is a question I actually got an email on as well, and I want to stress this. You cannot uh, dynamically deform springs as part of assembly motion. Um, so you'll notice in the cylinder head example a moment ago, I didn't have cylinder springs that compressed in that, and you can't do that today in the assembly level. There's no way to dynamically compress springs as part of the assembly motion. You can do some things in the part studio to manipulate and make a spring look like it's compressed, but it's not a part of you know parts interacting with each other at the assembly level. So that was a question I wanted to get out of the way. There's no dynamic deformation, a compression of springs at the assembly level. Now, that doesn't mean that there that will always be the case. So we'd like the feedback from you. Please use the feedback tool and let us know. Um, but that is not the case today. Um, with regards to general spring features, I think you'll see you know more in the area of customization in assemblies in general. I don't want to speak too specifically about springs, but you know better customization of the assembly towards your circumstances, I think, is, is the best way I would describe that. Um, and that kind of ties into the next question. Are there any feature scripts that could be applied to animating assemblies? No. As of today, feature script is not supported at the assembly level. But I will say that's something that many users have requested. If you haven't already, please request it using the feedback tool. Um, today, feature script is not supported at the assembly level. So you can't interact with feature script at the assembly level at all today. But I do know of you know a number of different things that would be neat to do with feature script at that at that level all right so we are almost out of time i want to leave the last few minutes here to an answer any outstanding questions 
So please type in any outstanding questions that you have. I want to leave you with one final comment here. Uh, if you're just getting started, this is your first kind of introduction into some of the assembly motion and things like that, and you're looking for follow-up, I definitely recommend checking out the Onshape Learning Center. You'll find it at learn.onshape.com. There's self-paced training, so if you want to go through at your own pace, at your own time, and learn some of these topics, you can you can find that there. There's also the option for instructor-led training, where you can actually have a live instructor. And there's also technical briefings. Technical briefings are just you know technical white papers, so to speak, on certain topics. And they can help you to answer certain frequently asked questions. So a very valuable resource if you're getting started, you're looking to dive into Onshape. Um, this is probably the single biggest library that we have of learning content. So that's what I had planned for you. Again, as I mentioned before, I'm going to stick around for a few more minutes and answer any outstanding questions. So please make sure to type them in in the next few minutes. Um, but that's what I had. Thank you, everyone. And have a good day.